Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des théères Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver But at the same time, he hasn't worn masks consistently. Yeah, but, He's pushed that, back against things yeah. you've said. See, I, I think that's less an anti-science than it's more uh, a statement. What kind of a statement? You know, a statement of strength, like we're strong, we don't need a, we don't need a mask, that kind of thing. Is you that, know, he sometimes equates wearing a mask with weakness. Does that make sense to you? No, it doesn't, of course not. Do you have a feeling that there is sometimes an all-out war against science? Oh, yeah. I mean, particularly over the last few years, there's an anti-authority feeling in the world. And science has an air of authority to it. So people who want to push back on authority tend to, as a sidebar, push back on science. He's going to lock down. This guy wants to lock down. He'll listen to the scientists. If I listened totally to the scientists, we would right now have a country that would be in a massive depression. Okay, President mm. Trump making Dr. Fauci's point for him. Good morning and welcome to Morning Joe. Well, you know, let, let's just, can we stop there for a second? Sure. Just because actually in the first couple of minutes, yeah. uh, we saw two contrasts of America. And one of them actually is is based on science years of study centuries of study yeah on education on knowledge on uh, the very things that <laughs> got us i'm serious here got us out of medieval times got us out of the middle ages the age of enlightenment the age of reason the age of medicine and science and learning and versus uh, Donald Trump's very medieval view of the world that science, if I had listened to science, yes, if you'd listened to science, Donald, 220,000 people wouldn't be dead right now. And you know, it's yeah. it's really, Mika, fact. one of the more surprising things for me have been number of friends, some very good friends that I have, um, the number of friends, number of acquaintances, number of educated people uh, who still are believing what they read on Facebook and still yeah. believing what they hear from Donald's mouth, which is that this is all a political hoax. Still believe that. Got friends who tell me that this is going to be over, that COVID is going to be over the day after the election because they believe that this is a political hoax. They still believe that 220,000 people buried their loved ones and, 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 and thousands of people will be suffering from the consequences of having this disease for the rest of their lives uh, in furtherance of a political hoax. So my friends who tell me it's no worse than the flu, it's the same thing as the flu when Donald Trump himself told Bob Woodward back in February it was five times deadlier than the flu. But this is this is it's why what's happening right now is far more than a referendum on Donald Trump's four years in office, his political views, his political agenda, because he really doesn't have a political agenda. He is a president who is governed by gesture. This is instead a referendum on a lot more, a referendum on whether we believe our Constitution says what it says, or whether we want to have a president who runs around saying, 
that Article 2 gives him the power to do whatever he wants to do, that federal judges' authority can be questioned, that the media is, in, in Joseph Stalin's words, the enemy of the people, uh, that there are no legitimate checks and balances against him, that the entire concept of Madisonian democracy over 240 years is for nil when it comes to him. And then add on science, add on medicine, add on basic learning. And you have that versus super superstition. This is, it, it, please, if, if you don't think people aren't going to look back at those rallies with the same horror that we now look back on the Salem witch trials, you don't think that's going to happen 50 years from now, 100 years from now? You're kidding yourself in the middle of a pandemic. Long after we are all gone, people will be showing these images and asking what happened to America, or at least a large subset of America. And what happened was Donald Trump. And history uh, and Americans in the future are gonna have to grapple with that, as are those right now who are working day in and day out to further his agenda or the tens of millions of people who are actually going along with this and actually believing that Anthony Fauci actually is making money off of vaccines. A lie that continues to spread on Facebook. I do I do wonder, Nika, when this is all over, the Facebook reckoning. You know, it, it's so hilarious. I saw, I actually saw an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. And the columnist, whose name doesn't deserve to be repeated on this program, was talking about the liberal dominance yeah. of Facebook. It's so bad that the most viewed sites on Facebook are all right-wing, not conservative, are all right-wing extremists who are pushing alternative facts. That's what Facebook has become. It's become a propaganda outfit. And this is one of the things, Democrats are so stupid. They really are. <laughs> Democrats and liberals in the media are so, so People stupid. Lie. Because somebody will say, oh, Facebook is, Facebook is unfair to conservatives. Oh, what do we do? Why, why do we, we, we can't have them calling us bad? Yes, you can. Like, that's what conservatives think they can lie through their teeth. These right-wingers think at Wall Street Journal editorial page, think they can lie through their teeth and talk about Facebook having problems and Twitter having problems with a story mm -hmm. that even the New York Post knew was a lie. They knew it was such a lie. We'll get to this, but that, okay. That they put a woman's name on the story reportedly that didn't even know her name was going to be on the story. The man who wrote that story knew it was such a lie. The New York Post knew it was such a lie that he refused to put his name on that story. They publish a series of lies peddled them by Rudy Giuliani, who admitted that nobody else would take it but Rupert Murdoch's New York Post, because they might look into it and tell the truth. And Democrats saying, oh, what are, what are we going to do? So, so I'm not talking about Democrats now. I'm just saying historically. Mm hmm. Republicans have been able to lie like this and columnists at the Wall Street Journal editorial page going, what are we going to do about the liberal problem at Facebook? When again, day in and day out, the most viewed pages on Facebook, the most shared pages on Facebook are from right wing conspiracy theorists, anti anti Trumpers who present a disgusting, twisted view of the world. And then Republicans like Josh Hawley. I mean, he's serious. I don't know him at all, so this isn't personal, but is he either the stupidest person ever to walk in the halls of Congress or the most disingenuous? 
He's going, we have a problem with it. We need to censor Facebook. We have, do you, oh, Josh, you can, really, Josh? Oh, you're a conservative? And you have to censor a private, I got problems yeah. with Mark Zuckerberg. I think 230 should be eliminated. I think it should be, I, I think it, like we broke up the baby belts. I think Facebook should be broken into a thousand pieces after what they did in 2016, letting the Russians in. And Sheryl Sandberg learning that the, the, the board was being told about this and getting angry that the truth was getting up. They should be broken into a million pieces. But Josh, you want to censor a company that's like private? <laughs> really? Hey, didn't you go to Harvard Law School or something? Like seriously, did they teach you that you can like ban private businesses? No, no. I, 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 where I went to, we didn't learn that in law school. It is Monday, the 19th of October of 2020. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is River City Hash Mondays. Hey, yeah, it's the weekend. And we, of course, take all this left over from the weekend and repurpose it into a lovely gourmet dish. And uh, it is. It seems like a common enough plate but uh no no it's elevated quite elevated and i'll tell you why because apparently joe biden is mr rogers and he listens to scientists that is the uh closing argument that the gop and trump has seems like a winning strategy when you're a bunch of i don't know anti-authoritarian anti-science bigots Mr. Rogers, ah, he's a softy, limp-wristed. <laughs> Anti-science? Yeah, that's the only way to be a real man. Listens to scientists like that's a bad thing. If Trump had listened to scientists, we might have a couple hundred thousand less people dead in the midst of all this. One would hope. Oh, uh... The Russian troll bots are out in force. I got hit by one last night, and uh, I had to block. I got tired of putting up with the spam. Oh, and it's a uh, spam about Joe Biden and Hunter Biden, and their and and Joe Biden's campaign is dead now because they've uncovered all sorts of stuff. And yeah, I love the links I got. I got linked to Town Hall. Oh boy, and Larouche. I am not going to open up those files. Excuse me. Lyndon LaRouche? You're going to link to Lyndon LaRouche? And Town Hall. Give me a break. They really think that we're as stupid as the deplorables who really eat up this BS. This is not 2016. All right? And I'll say another thing. They think <laughs> that that uh, this is going to work. But, you know, we hadn't have not been inundated, blasted, bombarded with over 40 years of uh, anti-Joe propaganda to the point that everything from opening a door to a church to, I don't know, biscuit recipes is considered to be tantamount to the most evil thing that Joe could ever do like what they did to Hillary. We have not been primed in the same fashion to just unthinkingly, blindingly hate Joe Biden. You know what? It takes about 30 to 40 years to really embed it in the uh, human mind, apparently, at least here in America. You can go to any liberal, mostly any liberal, and say, Hillary, and you know what the first response they'll be if they're given a Rorschach test? Yeah, evil. Even liberals think she's evil. I have to put up with Rose type Twitter types all the time about how evil Hillary is. Really? Prove it. And one of the links? Yeah. The equivalent of Town Hall and London LaRouche. The equivalent of it. 
the propaganda works when the propaganda works over a period of time. All right. I apologize that their effort did not work. I know it's important to them to continue whatever it is that they call this government. Because they are certainly resting the idea of democracy. Uh, putting a knee to the throat of it, looks like. So much news. So much news. All around the world, too. Yeah. Uh, it looks like uh, coronavirus is surging everywhere. Everywhere. And some uh, anti-science types would say, well, you know, even masks didn't work. Look, those people wore masks. Yeah, well, as idiots like you who didn't, and uh, you're causing it to spread further. You know, we have to give up Thanksgiving and Christmas now. Of course, Joe will be blamed for it. It's a war on Christmas. Yeah, a war on Christmas was when Melania went into the White House and decorated whatever it is that she I know that she was on that she is on tape admitting like F Christmas, why do I have to decorate for Christmas? I'm sorry, but if you're gonna be a Russian asset, a handler, you gotta kinda like live as the Romans live, okay? Do as the Romans do. Didn't they teach you that in FSB spy school? Jeez. So spoiled. I don't want to decorate for Christmas, these stupid Americans. Yeah, well, you know what? Uh, we're not going to let you get away with it either, you birther. Racist birther Melania. Okay. It's going to be nice to have a first lady that, you know, we can embrace as being a first lady instead of, I don't know, I'm not against immigrants, please. But I am against people from other countries coming here to F us up on purpose. Under orders. So who does Trump owe a billion dollars to? You know, it'd be kind of important to know that. Why is it that the media continues hammering Joe about why won't he talk about court packing and now he won't talk about Hunter? Even the New York Post is disavowing itself from that story. <laughs> oh my God. And I've got these Russian troll bots, and that's what they are. Pushing out this BS that even black people don't like Joe. Oh, really? That's not Russian agitprop either. Do you think we're as stupid as the deplorables who vote for Trump? Do you think this is 2016 again? Do you think that we have been bombarded with anti-Joe propaganda for the last 40 years? It worked with Hillary. It's not working with Joe. All right. You don't know American politics well enough, apparently. Did you see the lines? And I'm not talking about just from voter suppression. These early voting lines are just tremendous. I hate the idea that there's lines there. Now, I have read from some county registrars in various counties in various states across the country who said that, yeah, then, you know, the first few days of early voting, we really don't know until we get it. Uh, you know, what, what the load will be. And then later, a few days later, or, you know, they, they figured it out. And then th those wait lines are, you know, down from eight hours to, in some instances, 20 minutes, 15 minutes. That is heartening to see. Of course, does anyone find it odd that Donald Trump says that he's going to beat Biden in California? Right after illegal drop boxes have been distributed across the state and Joe has a 31 point lead. <laughs> yeah, they cheat. And every single one of those unauthorized drop off boxes. And, you know, I got to say, I'm just going to say where they've had those drop off boxes. I think that mostly Republicans will be voting in them. I would say one should probably hold those ballots until they can be confirmed. And if an I wasn't dotted and a T not crossed, I guess you'll just have to throw them out now, won't you? 
What's good for the goose is good for the gander. I don't know. But I would presume that maybe those ballots are tainted since they've been in an unauthorized uh, drop box. See if those votes can be verified. All right. And if they can't, then you're just going to have to throw them out. I am sorry. That's the way it is. You made the rules. I know you don't follow the rules when they apply to you. When you make the rules and then we actually try to apply the rules that you made. Oh, but then, oh, no, no. When we hold up a SCOTUS nominee for almost two years, that's that, that, that's on you. You know, you can't do that to us. What do you think this is? A representative democracy? Yeah, actually, we do. And we're going to get it back, thankfully. And it's not because of magic. All right? Democracy doesn't just appear magically. It takes hard work. And once you think you're done, you got to start over because... The corrosive elements that destroy democracy never sleeps. Rust never sleeps. Let's keep working. All right. Enough of that. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Some North Dakota voters want their Republican governor to take a more aggressive tack on the virus. Yeah, they'd like to because people are dying right and left there. Black officers nationwide break with police unions endorsements of Trump. Yeah, I don't blame them. And an Indiana police recruit fired for ties to neo-Nazis raises troubling questions about departments across the country. Well, I've been saying I told you so since I trademarked I told you so. That was a long time ago. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where the U.K. policeman sickened in the Russian poison attack in Salisbury a couple of years ago, you know, with the scripples. Well, he has quit his job because of medical complications from that event. And transit shutdowns fail to deter the Thai pro-democracy protests. Though the Thai royals are trying to censor any news about those protests. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com off to the right-ish of the page is our chat room link and it is right there by the social media scroll you can't miss it and the chat room is monitored by kelly lincoln thank you kelly to the leftish of that chat room link that is near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com you will then notice the link to our patreon page and yes yes we have to pay bills and uh, we are able to do so because of your generosity. And there have been a few of you who have been very generous over many, many years. And did you know that it's been almost 10 years now of continuous 365, 24-7 resistance radio? Because uh, we have a dedicated calling. And our calling is to fulfill our civic duty. And what is our civic duty? Well, <laughs> many things. Part of it is to find and elect more and better Democrats. Got to do that. But also to resist where resistance is needed. And is it ever needed now? You have been instrumental in that. And there are those of you who could be instrumental if you could afford, even in these times of peril. An espresso-type coffee drink, send those funds our way. Uh, we stretch those dollars really beyond compare. 
And even though things exist because we can measure them on the quantum level, oh boy, do we stretch them, stretch them, stretch them. And we stretch those dollars, pay our bills, fly under the radar, continue resistance broadcasting as the founders originally intended oh so many years ago. Thank you for your generosity and thank you uh, in the future, almost sort of like a minority report type thing where we say thank you for your generosity in the future. Indeed. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, it is so simple because Tom made it simple. Thank you, Tom. Follow us on Twitter at Netroots Radio. How simple is that? Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. And uh, you might as well because I mostly post the show notes and links diary there. When I say mostly, it's all the time. And then I get it put out on social media like you're supposed to. And those show notes and links are very important, as you know. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts. And that's serious. Pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, YouTube, iTunes, etc., 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 wherever. Deezer. What the heck is Deezer? Well, it's a podcast distributor. And you can find all of our Netroots Radio shows there. You can. We better dive into this first offering here because... I used to go to the Dakotas every summer. I'd pay my way, too. Isn't that weird? Pay my way to work for free on the family farm? Well, I had room and board. They fed you. That was good. I had a place to sleep. But, uh, yeah, when I was a kid, starting about when I was 11, I paid my way on a bus trip. Took about four days and five nights. That's how it worked. No. No, not five days and four nights. You ended up in uh, where? Bismarck, I think we were, where I got let off. And then my uncle came and picked me up. And then there was another 60-mile uh, drive to get to the farm. But, yeah, uh, pretty much about 9 o'clock at night was when uh, when I get dropped off. Boy, I made it easy on them. You know, farmers go to bed early because they get up so darn early, too. But, anyway, I would go to the Dakotas every summer to bale hay and alfalfa and bring in the corn. And there was also, well, uh, you know, there was a small dairy concern there, too, which is considered large for the region. Uh, my uncle, uh, well, the family farm, my uncle pretty much took it over when uh, he got it from my grandparents. But uh, because all the other kids moved away as fast as they could. I'm getting out of here, the farm. But uh, Uncle Norman took care of that farm and had about 60 head of milking cattle which makes that a pretty large dairy concern. I didn't think it was that big at the time, but it was. So I got to experience the Dakotas in all its fine, bigoted glory. Uh, Yeah, well into the 70s, when I would spend a lot of time there, uh, there'd be signs everywhere, no Indians allowed. And I thought, how can that be? I mean, we have the civil rights movement. I mean, this is all old news. Yeah, it was only, you know, civil rights... Uh, act had only been into effect for old oh, maybe you know five years or so, so it's not like people were really used to it yet. So I always found uh, the the Dakotas to be uh, well, to be honest with you, a little scary, uh huh, quite scary. And now I guess my fears are uh, justified. This article here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press by, uh, oh, James McPherson. James Yancer strode into a Harbor Freight tool store in one of North Dakota's worst hotspots for the coronavirus, brushing off a sign telling customers to wear a face mask. If they kick me out, I'll go somewhere else, Yancer said. Oh, really? Calling masks about as effective as blocking the virus is stopping sand with chicken wire. No, that's not quite what it is. The virus is actually bigger in proportion to what sand would be with chicken wire, just so you know. Okay. Uh, Despite the Bismarck store's mask requirement, the 69-year-old trucking company owner wasn't asked to leave because, hey, who wants to be the virus mask police and get into the face of one of these idiots? I just don't take BS from people, Yancer said. 
I rely on my own common sense. In other words, you're a freaking bully. That's what you are. Common sense. If you knew one iota of how a virus works, you wouldn't be making this comparison like, oh, it's like stopping sand with chicken wire. Actually, you can stop sand with chicken wire when enough sand builds up on the other side of it. But by that time, the chickens are dead. It's a common attitude in highly conservative North Dakota and one many believe has contributed to the state's ranking in recent weeks among the worst in the nation for the coronavirus spread. The state's worsening numbers have pointed sharp questions over how Republican Governor Doug Burgum, who is up for re-election next month, has handled the virus. Even some supporters wish Burgum a wealthy former Microsoft executive would take a tougher line in terms of requiring masks and enforcing limits on social gatherings and business occupancies. Claudia Lauer of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Police unions nationwide have largely supported Trump's re-election amid mass demonstrations over police brutality and accusations of systemic racism. But a number of black law enforcement officers are speaking out against these endorsements, saying their concerns over entering the 2020 political fray were ignored. Well, that's because of systemic racism now, wouldn't that be? Trump has touted his support from the law enforcement community, which includes endorsements from national, city, and state officers' unions, some of which publicly endorsed a political candidate for the first time. He's running on what he calls a law and order platform, which is rich, coming from a gangster like him, and tapping into a strain of anger and frustration felt by law enforcement who believe they are being unfairly accused of racial discrimination. Oh, really now? Really? Unfairly? Please. There are more than 8,000 law enforcement agencies in the U.S. with large departments holding sway nationally. The number of minority officers in policing has more than doubled in the last three decades, but many departments still have a smaller percentage of black and, and Hispanic officers compared to the percentage of the general population those communities make up. Many fraternal black police organizations were formed to advocate for equality within police departments, but also to focus on how law enforcement affects the wider black community. There have often been tensions between minority organizations and larger unions, like in August, when the National Association of Black Law Enforcement Officers issued a letter condemning the use of deadly force, police misconduct, and abuse in communities of color. Oh, and the white unions didn't like that, apparently. Hey. While support for the Republican incumbent does not strictly fall along racial lines, many black officers say the endorsements for Trump don't fairly represent all dues-paying members. We're members of these unions, and they don't take into consideration our feelings about Donald J. Trump. Then they don't care about us, and they don't care about our dues, said Rochelle Bilal, the recent past president of the Guardian Civic League of Philadelphia, calling the National Fraternal Order of Police's Trump endorsement an outrage. Bilal, who was elected as Philadelphia's first black female sheriff last year, spoke at an early October news conference with other black law enforcement groups in Philadelphia to condemn Trump endorsements and the process, they say, ignored their concerns over what they perceived 
to be racist remarks, support for white supremacist groups, and a lack of respect for women from Donald Trump. Worker bees at the Associated Press bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. A police recruit in northwestern Indiana was fired less than 24 hours after the department was notified that the officer was involved in a neo-Nazi online chat forum. The Lafayette Police Department launched an investigation into Joseph Zasharek, who was hired in June after being notified on Twitter Friday evening of his possible participation in a chat forum called Iron March in 2016. The department's internal division concluded the information was accurate and credible, and Zasharek was terminated according to a Saturday news release from Chief Patrick Flannelly. The chat forum disbanded in 2017, but his posts were leaked online late last year, according to the Lafayette Journal and Courier. Flannelly told the newspaper that Zasharek was called into the station Friday and admitted the comments were his. He was fired by noon the next day. Officer Zasharek's comments were not in harmony with the spirit of cooperation and inclusion in the community that the Lafayette Police Department values, Flanley said in the release. The department said that Zasharek had been in training and had no exposure to the public. He, no, really, he didn't. He's the only Nazi bad apple in the whole barrel. Please trust us. The department acknowledged that it did not discover the information prior to hiring Zasharek, despite conducting, quote, very thorough and complete background investigations on potential employees, which includes a review of social media accounts, according to the statement. Well, I guess they didn't have so thorough and complete a background as uh, they say now, do they? Flanley told the newspaper the department would review his background check processes. Attempts to reach Zasharek on Sunday yesterday were unsuccessful. No listed phone number could be located. Police Lieutenant Matt Gard said the department was unable to provide Zasharek's contact information because pretty much cops stay together, especially when one of their own is found out to be a neo-Nazi. Now, the kid has come out with a statement where he did uh, say, yeah, I took part in those discussions, but I was trying to find a higher level of discussion on neo-fascism than what he was able to find on 4chan. Well, I guess they better start looking at the social media accounts of not only recruits across America, but maybe the police themselves who are wearing the badges. And while we're at it, how about they pee in a jar for steroid use? Why would a police union be against that? Okay, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. (laughs) 
This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, context. All In, The Fight for Democracy is a new and timely documentary featuring Stacey Abrams, fresh from her 2018 run for governor of Georgia against the eventual winner, Brian Kemp. A race much watched as Abrams was the first African-American woman to run for governor under the aegis of a major party. I found out about All In from an article in which the author claimed that the film was weakened by its tangents into American voting history. And it's for moments such as this one that African-Americans have coined a useful phrase, you have got to be out of your goddamn mind. Directors Lisa Cortez and Liz Garbus have not made a film about Stacey Abrams. They have used Abrams' failed run as a core narrative in a film about American voter suppression. It's a tight, effective illustration of what we all should have learned in school, that the history of America is, from its inception, a history of power seekers keeping a whole bunch of people from voting. And if you don't look at Jim Crow and poll taxes and literacy tests and anti-voter terrorism, then you don't get why so much of the classic civil rights struggles were about registration and access to polls. And you need all that to get the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which you need in order to understand the tragedy of the Supreme Court gutting it in 2013 by its decision in Shelby County v. Holt. A gutting that directly allowed for Brian Kemp, Georgia's Secretary of State, a man who remained in charge of administering the very election that he was running in, to engage in a slew of voter suppression tactics that silenced hundreds of thousands of Georgia voters. The strength of all in the fight for democracy is how it gives us the context we need to understand that Georgia's gubernatorial tragedy is part of our larger story, that of a democracy that suffers its most severe attacks from within. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Jason Goldman. Wild animals are equipped with a variety of techniques to avoid becoming lunch for a bigger, toothier animal. The most well-known methods include the classic fight and flight, as well as freeze. A team of researchers wondered how proximity to people might impact those survival strategies. We often see that animals are more tolerant around us in urban areas, but we don't really know why. UCLA evolutionary biologist Dan Blumstein Is it a filtering process where only the tolerant animals are there? Is it just individual plasticity, meaning individuals habituate or change their their fear of us, and that leads to tolerance? You know, or can there be an evolutionary dynamic occurring? To find out, Blumstein and his colleagues combined information from 173 studies of more than 100 species, including mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, and even mollusks. Turns out that regardless of evolutionary lineage, the animals react in a similar way to life among humans. They lose their anti-predator traits. That pattern is especially pronounced for herbivores and for social species. This behavioral change is perhaps unsurprising when it's intentional, the result of domestication and a controlled breeding paradigm. But it turns out that urbanization alone results in a similar change, though much more slowly around three times more slowly. The results are in the journal PLOS Biology. The main point is that we're essentially domesticating animals by urbanization. We're selecting for the same sorts of traits that we would if we were actually trying to domesticate them. If the urbanization process helps animals better coexist with people, it could be to their benefit. But if it makes them more vulnerable to their non-human predators, it could be a real problem. Either way, these results mean that city living exerts enough of an influence on wild animals that evolutionary processes kick in. Those reductions in anti-predator traits become encoded in their genes. We're changing the population genetics and changing genetic variation. Um, We are reducing, we are eliminating variation. And if variation is a good thing and, and is a target of conservation, then that's something to be concerned with. What the researchers now wonder is whether the mere presence of tourists in less urbanized areas can instigate similar changes in wild animals. If so, serious questions exist for the notion of ethical, welfare-oriented ecotourism. If we wish to help animals retain their anti-predator defenses, the researchers say, we might have to intentionally expose animals to predators, or at least to predator-related cues. 
it's just it's yet one other way that we're you know changing the world around us. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Jason Goldman. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Sometimes I don't know whether to weep uncontrollably, laugh hysterically, or just throw up. I recently did all three when I saw another gusher of greed pouring out of corporate America. This one is especially nauseating, given today's raging health crisis, for the culprits are major health care corporations. One perpetrator is Larry Merlot, CEO of our country's largest drugstore chain, CVS. In this time of COVID-19, customers are surging into the chain's 10,000 stores for everything from medications to masks. Yet, the boss has blithely left many of the pharmacies so severely understaffed that they pose a danger to public health. CVS pharmacists tell of frantically scrambling to keep up with filling prescriptions, answering ever-ringing phone inquiries, giving shots and COVID tests, stocking toilet paper, tending the drive through etc., while also having to meet ceaseless corporate demands for cost-cutting and more profit. The result has been a dangerous work overload, with many pharmacists handling nearly 200 prescriptions in a six-hour shift, about one every two minutes. Unsurprisingly, there's been an alarming rise in serious errors and week-long delays in providing critical medications for customers. Adding to the exasperation of local managers, who are allowed no say in staffing, is the infuriating level of heedless greed at the top. The New York Times reports that while CEO Merlot has failed to fund the staff his pharmacies need, he has generously funded his own needs. He paid himself $36.5 million last year alone. Then there's the mountain of interest payments and fees that CVS is paying to Wall Street bankers and lawyers who engineered Merlot's takeover of the Aetna health insurance giant last year. This is Jim Hightower saying, So while you're being underserved at a local CVS, just remember that boss man Merlot and his merger mercenaries are making a killing. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 2013. That was the day that two workers on California's Bay Area Rapid Transit, or BART as it is more commonly called, were struck and killed by a train. Christopher Shepard was a BART track engineer. Lawrence Daniels was a contract employee. Both men had years of experience working on the tracks. They were inspecting the tracks when they were hit and killed. Workers who usually operated the trains were out on strike. The Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 1555, and SEIU, Local 1021, had walked off the job the day before. The strike disrupted the daily commute of 400,000 Bay Area travelers. The unions were on strike for improved wages and safer working conditions. The union wanted bulletproof glass for station agent booths for worker safety. They also asked for improved lighting in the tunnels. According to an article in Mother Jones, quote, a BART spokesman called the safety issues a smokescreen, arguing that contract negotiations were not the place to raise them. In response to the strike, BART was training a replacement worker to run the train when the tragedy occurred. The manager, who was supposed to monitor the unexperienced driver, had left the car. In addition, the National Transportation Safety Board found that BART had no way for workers on the tracks to communicate with the drivers. The family of Lawrence Daniels sued BART, which settled for $300,000. The union and BART settled the strike two days after the tragic deaths. The union won nearly a 16% pay raise. 
The union also won safety upgrades, but management won concessions on employee contributions to medical benefits and pensions. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River, here in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 48 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting to be a tad cooler than yesterday with a high topping out around 74 or 75. I call that a proper West Coast uh, fall day, wouldn't you? Well, you might. Well, we'll be cloudy early, becoming mostly sunny this afternoon. Winds will be light and variable. With mainly clear skies tonight, lows in the low 40s, with winds remaining light and variable. Some clouds in the morning tomorrow will give way to mainly sunny skies, with highs uh, around 70 to 73. Winds light and variable. Confirmed coronavirus cases in Jackson County, here in the southern part of Oregon, is now at 1448. And uh, we will get an update. Our weekend totals are not completely total. Uh, we'll, we unfortunately will see a rise in those confirmed cases. The confirmed deceased stand at six. And of course, that is an undercount. Ragweed pollen is moderate right outside the window here at the mothership in, Ro- in Rogue River proper. The air quality index is in the good range, which is green. Green for good. At 30 parts per million, and that daytime UV index is moderate at 3. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.22 inches. Visibility, though, is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 98%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted, these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. Well, uh, you know, they can deny the steel dossier P tape all they want, but this is my P tape. And uh, we try not to pop the piece. You know, the only thing that has not con- been confirmed just as, you know, an ancillary to this whole diatribe, the only thing not really confirmed in the steel dossier, even though it was raw data, not a dossier, The only thing not confirmed is whether the Russian hookers peed on the bed or peed on Trump when he was on the bed. That's the only thing that they can't confirm. All righty. Let's look at weather from around the world because London right now is 60 degrees and partly cloudy. Paris is 60 degrees and sunny. How nice. Rome is 70 degrees and sunny. Kiev is 50 degrees and fair. Kabul is 65 and fair. Hong Kong is 72 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 55 with rain. Sydney, Australia is 64 and cloudy. San Francisco, California is 55 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 62 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world.
the ubiquitous anonymous worker bees, this time at the Associated Press, bring us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A British police officer who was poisoned while investigating the nerve agent attack against a former Russian agent in England two years ago has quit, saying the incident took so much from me that he could no longer do the job. Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey was exposed to Novichok when he touched the door handle at the Salisbury home of former Russian spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia in 2018. The two Russians were targeted in an attack that British authorities said had almost certainly approved had almost certainly been approved at a senior level of the Russian state. An allegation that Moscow has vehemently denied, and they always do. In a series of tweets, Bailey said he has experienced his fair share of trauma and violence during his 18 years in service. But the impact of the uh, poisoning attack should not be underestimated, he said. The events in Salisbury in March 2018 took so much from me, he uh, wrote, and although I've tried so hard to make it work, I know I won't find peace whilst remaining in that environment. Bailey spent two weeks hospitalized in, in intensive care after he was poisoned and had made several attempts to return to work. The scripple survived, but the attack later claimed the life of British resident Don Sturgis, who came into contact with a perfume bottle believed to have been used in the attack and then discarded. Her partner fell seriously ill from his contact with Novichok, but recovered. Britain accuses two Russian military intelligence agents of traveling to the UK for the poisoning operation. But Russian President Vladimir Putin has claimed the suspects were civilians. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Jeremy Harmer of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Pro-democracy activists in Thailand staged a fifth straight day of high-profile protests in the capital yesterday, Sunday, thwarting efforts by the authorities to stop them, including a weekend shutdown of the city's mass transit systems. Unlike protests earlier in which police used a water cannon to disperse protests, protesters, demonstrators were peaceful with no reports of any clashes by the time participants starting, started heading home in the evening. The protesters are calling for Prime Minister Paruth Sean Ocha to leave office, the Constitution to be amended to make it more democratic, and the nation's monarchy to undergo reform. All stations at Bangkok's elevated sky train uh, transit system were closed on uh, beginning Saturday afternoon uh, to keep protesters from gathering. And the underground MRT system was also shut and the police blocked off several roads. Protesters met anyway as planned at sky train stations where they held small impromptu rallies. In effect, establishing a temporary but active presence across the city. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on and we'll meet up tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 